So um, it's a couple of years since I've done a little um, VSF talk on time. So I thought it was time for an update, excuse the pun. And um, since then, um, my family, my in fact, my children's families have expanded a lot. So I don't know if you remember, but I actually told you how many how many 25 frames per second um, frames I've had in my life two years ago. I'm now up to 42 and a half billion frames since my epoch. And my eldest granddaughter, Esther, who's now two years and five months old, has actually had 1.8 billion frames at 25 frames a second of her life from her epoch. But since then, very excitedly, um, we've actually had two other grandchildren. So I will keep you up to date in the future times with how many frames they're accumulating with their epoch. Anyway, moving on from my personal time to time in general. I think I used a couple of these quotes last time I was talking about time, but I think there are some some great some great thoughts here from some very learned people in our past to actually uh, to reflect upon briefly. But thinking about time and and why we actually need to use time, and the main thing is actually to coordinate things. And if I jump back into the history in the UK, we go back to 1840, and that's the first time we actually had. The need or realize the need for actually coordinating time be between locations so we could actually run the railways to a timetable and actually everyone knew what the relative time was. Also, and we're going to come back to this in a minute, you know, we used to use like various time sources to set things like set our watch. I mean, my watch sets automatically now, but I do remember very excitedly the first time I dialed the speaking clock. I guess you had a similar thing in, in the in the US and other countries you may be in um, listening to this um, or we used to listen to the radio and um, in the UK there's the pips and again we'll talk about that in a minute but what I want to get on to thinking about is where time really matters within a production chain that we're involved in because if you think about it there is um, there is the time where we're at we're actually acquiring the signals the video camera the and the, the audio and the microphones there is the production people that are actually needing to actually be in a time zone to do their production. And then there's the consumption. And we'll analyze all of those um, a little bit as we move forward. Um, uh, hello again to Mr. Just John Mayer. He's going to join join some conversation towards the end of this presentation and as once we uh, get into things a bit. But in the history of broadcasting, we've actually put a lot of effort into co-timing things and um, more recently, we've been using GPS to actually synchronize our, our, our plants. Um, there is, we still have um, uh, a fairly low frequency uh, time signal that's broadcast from a massive array of transmitters in the north of England, um, that which we synchronize things to. And of course, pretty well every piece of video quick here, this is a CCU, has a genlock input. It's the way of keeping things in time and, and of course moving into the modern age of the, the 2110 world um, and the AS67 world, we're using PTP as the way of actually working out absolute, being aware of absolute time and therefore the relative timing of the different elements that we're looking at. But thinking about time and how we treat time in broadcast, I think it's important because I think we've reached a cusp of potentially doing time in a new way um, in the way we actually do production as we come more virtual, but more of that in a little bit. But I just wanna do a little bit of homework so just a reminder that way back in time, some almost we're coming up for almost like 100 years ago, um, there was a very first broadcast. This is Betty Bolton. Two things about this. You'll see this raster scan was actually um, vertical rather than horizontal. And the other interesting thing is she was actually in a dark room and the way it was actually scanned was with a single photo cell and there was a flying dot of light put onto her body. So the synchronization was that rather than the, the conventional way we now have um, or that we used to use with a raster scan like this, with a, with a tube that was actually able to scan and we had all of those flyback times. But the reason I'm putting this up is because the heritage, even where we are in 2021, goes back as far as this because we had the flyback time, the line flyback and the field flyback time. And we've actually been using, exploiting, accommodating that right up to including some of the modeling we do in 2110 in the way we actually do things now. Then of course, there's been various other elements um, of innovation as we've gone. So 
once we got into the 1980s, this is me on my wedding day in 1987. Look at my hair there and that pink bow tie. Crazy, hey? Um, but what we had here is, first of all, we had all of the elements of a signal co-timed together in an SDI signal. So we've got the horizontal and vertical blanking. We're actually carrying the time code. So we have actually got a production time for each of those video frames being carried. We're carrying all of the audio as well. And that's what I call kind of our composite video phase, as in everything going together. And then, of course, the great innovation that we did about five years ago is moving to um, essence based production, where we're actually splitting up all of the elements, which, of course, means we eventually need to bring them back together at the right relative timing um, because we've pulled them all, all together. Now, one of the key things that's enabled us to actually take that approach is the fact that within the specification of, of ST2110, we actually defined time, the, the use of timing um, into the RTP timestamp. So we take PTP, a, a real time, absolute time, and we actually, every frame of video and every audio sample, we're actually marking with a reduced resolution version of that timing information. Now, all timing is not equal. And even if you think back to what we were talking about, the, uh, the, the scanning of Betty and everything else we've done in the terms of the way we capture images, some of those are absolute moments in time and some of them are spread moments in time. And depending on the way your video sensors work in the cameras of, of, of gone, bygone days and even now, um, depends on the way and whether you're capturing an absolute static moment in time or you're actually capturing a, capturing a rolling moment in time as you go through a video frame. But once we get it into 2110, we've done one or two naughty things with RTP um, in that we've actually frozen the timestamp as we go through a video frame. For very good reason, because we actually want to say each one of those, um, the timestamp on each one of the packets that relates to that moment in time is actually constant. So that's the way we've handled time for video in 2110. And then, of course, for audio, we actually tick the time code at the sampling rate. So we have 48 kilohertz time and clock and we, or 96 if you're, if you're a real audio connoisseur. And we actually tick through um, with, with the timings there. But just going back to the heritage, because again, I just want to keep coming back to this because this is the main point I'm going to make shortly, is that we actually have kind of a heritage in the way we've actually done everything from that analog video through to digital video and through to indeed 2022-6 and 2110-20 to some degree um, that we've actually been thinking of this linear time that's actually coming from the birth of that raster scan where we're actually scanning the image as we push it through the system. So linear video very much has been inherently fully linear because of the way um, video works. And if you look at the profiles in ST2110-21 that we defined, we actually have defined specific timing models based on, to some degree, the raster. So the, the, the narrow gapped version of timing actually allows for the fact that effectively in our raster heritage, we actually have this gap for the vertical vertical interval. And we're, we're making allowances of that in the way we propagate the data. And we propagate the data, if we want to do really low latency, we need to propagate the data in a certain way to accommodate that. Having said that, you know, moving forwards, most equipment is now accommodating both narrow and wide linear derivations, which means we're actually smoothly handing the, later, the data out, still in a serial manner, but we're actually handing it out linearly. Now, what, what constitutes real time in, in a live world now? Um, you know, I talked about the pips, which we used to use to synchronize our watches. You know, I used to very excitedly listen for, and I, I can remember probably even up till 10 years ago, listening to the pips from Radio 4 in the UK and making sure that my beloved $10 Casio watch was actually right on the, on, on the time. Nowadays, that doesn't really work because I don't know about you, but I actually listen now to the radio over the internet. I have a nice Sonos speaker system. And if I actually analyze when I'm actually listening to those pips, it's probably getting on for 
15 to 20 seconds after the real intended time. And I hark back to some of the contracts that um, certainly I was party to in distribution for video um, on in both the analog and FM days. In fact, those contracts still exist for the on-air DAB and FM um, and analog radio. Um, where there's a qualification that the whole end-to-end -end delivery chain should be no more than 100 milliseconds, because that's the maximum offset from absolute time the broadcasters wanted to have. There are other reasons for that as, you, as well, because they use it for queuing off air. But we also have scenarios now where, you know, even a direct-to-home final HEVC or H.264 encoder, if it's a good one that's doing a lot of, lot of look-ahead predictive coding, then actually we're, we're actually burning maybe up to five seconds of time to do a real, a decent real-time encode with, with decent look-ahead. And back to what the actual consumer wants, so me with my Sonos speaker listening to the radio, the fact is actually 20 seconds behind real-time most of the time doesn't really bother me. And most people that are consuming content in an OTT delivered manner are actually consuming it quite a significant time behind when it really was actually being, being put together. Now, what actually happens, what matters to the actual content producer about time? So the main thing about the, for the producer about time is the relative timing of the different elements that they're putting together. So we have acquisition, we have the view that the people involved in the production chain have both the like the video engineer in the, in the gallery that's doing the vision mix. We have the person in the audio booth doing the audio mix. For them, the most important thing is that the relative timing of those elements of their chain of the of the all of the constituent elements they're putting together are in a common time domain that they can live in for that production. And we'll come on to that in the end. And the same matters, obviously, at the end of the day. I'm pretty sure I showed this picture um, a couple of years ago as well, but I think it's worth um, just a revising because this was John Logie Baird's first test transmission back in 1936 of um, how to actually prove real time television in the UK. This was a test transmission they did. And because he had an electromechanical system, the only way he could actually get real world pictures into his system was to actually have a telecine function. So he was actually capturing the program on film and developing it in real time and going using a flying dot scanner, converting it in real time to the electrical signals to actually create the video. This meant that his real time broadcast system had 42 seconds of delay. Those 42 seconds were the fastest time they could get the film through the developing bath and into the telecine scanner to do it. Needless to say, Marconi won the battle and with an all electronic system, but that was the actual proposal that went live. And it meant that the continuity announcer, when they did the tests, had, had to be using a stopwatch with 42 seconds on it to actually work out the moment they actually needed to do the continuity um, announcement to actually keep it in real time. Moving through to time in a production workflow. Now, um, this is kind of, again, I think one or two of you will have probably seen this picture before because it's been a bit of a bugbear of mine. And in, I think a little bit of, in my mind, a bit of a lost, a lost cause that we had in the original specification of 2110 back, what, four or five years ago now, in as much as the, um, we very neatly, as I showed you in a previous diagram, have origination time. Origination time is captured by, basically the devices that are actually acquiring the video and audio, or at least the A to D converter of the microphone, actually is actually using real time at that moment to actually timestamp the, the RTP timestamp field of the 2110 essences. The challenge we have is, as we progress through a production workflow, the, um, the time that's taken by different processes may get lost and the origination time may get lost and that's because a lot of devices because we didn't really define otherwise and because it was probably easier for some vendors to do this every time we go through a processing function whatever that processing function is within the chain um, there wasn't a mandate that we actually honored the original source time that relates to you know, so frame x has a timestamp of n and then that frame X, when it comes out of that piece of equipment, it still is given that timestamp in. We didn't mandate that. In the revisions yeah. we've done in recent times to 2110, we actually are recommending that's an option. 
and we're actually giving people the chance to actually articulate that and describe what the behavior of your device is. So you can actually say, my device is actually honoring the original timing information that I had inbound to me. So I'm actually perpetuating the real relationships of time as we go through the system. Bear that in mind, because I think that's gonna be um, important moving forwards. And the same obviously applies to audio devices, although we do have a legacy challenge even more in the audio world because AES 67, it never had that concept. So as we move into the 2110-30 world, hopefully people may, may still be able to embrace this concept of honoring origination time through the plant. Because what we wanna be able to do at the use time on the right hand side there is to be able to reconcile the relative timing of the different paths and reconcile that versus whatever we know of absolute time as well. So we can actually put things together automatically rather than having to manually compensate for the, for the accumulation of latency within each of the processing paths and this kind of is an example of the kind of function you need to have within a processing device to allow you to do that so you need to actually be seeing at what point each video frame comes in what time stamp it has how that's being processed and where that goes to that allows us then to reconcile this time as we go through so we, we've actually got a number of different scenarios we need to consider because not only do we have the bottom one there where we've got a, you know, a device that's processing time, we also have top left, and I'm gonna come onto this in a minute and have a bit of a conversation with John on it as well. We actually have cloud infrastructure that's processing time, um, also that's processing things, and it's gonna take a time to do that. We also have the challenge on the right-hand side there where we've actually got multiple sources being put together. And the question is, how do you handle time then? Because can we rely on those, the sources being nominally co-timed so we actually can still do this timing propagation of origination time, or do we have to reconstitute time at moments like that within our production chain? Think Thoughts for discussion. Now, timing domains as we move forward in the way we do production in different ways actually becomes more of a challenge. So um, many of you will be starting to see some of the what, what I call proxy based remote production, where, where actually you actually in your kind of virtual gallery, which may be just a web browser, or it may be something more sophisticated than that. Um, you're actually looking at low res proxy images that are actually representations of the original feeds that you're actually gonna be doing your vision mix based on in your little gallery, wherever you are. And of course the time domain your gallery exists in is you know, effectively downstream because there's propagation time through a, a wide area network and there's, and there's low res proxy compression that's gone on as well. So you're in a time domain T plus X there on the right hand side and you, therefore, there's a round, there is a loop time because the decisions you make may, maybe need to go or obviously need, need to go back to the to the source. And this, depending on where your actual vision switching engine is, um, in typically it may actually be at the source of source location. Therefore, you actually need to or potentially need to consider if you want to do very accurate production, actually compensating for the time lost in that chain. And obviously. With things like ISO 7, we actually have the ability to actually accurately timestamp things like the pushing of buttons and the pushing of virtual buttons in a virtual gallery and allow us to actually do that reconciliation of time um, back in time, as long as we've actually got equipment that's able to post buffer that signal. There are one or two challenges it's very difficult to work through with these kind of loops. And that's things like the tally light because the tally light intrinsically is actually gonna be inherently late in this scenario. And unless someone's got some real magic to think about, then that's probably a challenge that we need to work through. So thinking about distributed production, and this is a, a slide I use quite a lot in many talks because this actually kind of defines the real, the, the, the essence of really what we're doing, I think as, as, a, as an industry now, being able to actually do different things in different places to make the most use of people, equipment, and physical real estate. 
And in doing that, we actually obviously have slightly different timing domains. So if you think about this timing domain here, you know, we've got our sources in our yellow time domain there. We've got a process and compute function in, in another time domain there. We've got another set of sources in another time domain and our gallery maybe is in yet another time domain. So we're living in a world where the absolute time is different in different places, but that doesn't matter as long as the way we behave can cope with that and we actually are able to reconcile those elements. There's interestingly talking to um, various people like people involved in sports production. Um, there, when, when technology comes along that offers something exciting, and this example here is augmented reality, which a lot of sports studios are using now, that actually means that the, the, you know, inherently those processes typically take several frames worth of video to actually do an augmented reality render and to get that in the workflow. So what we actually see is people actually are even splitting the time domains of a, of a production gallery to allow people to work in either the pre or post um, augmented reality time domain. So people are actually starting to accommodate working in different time zones. And I think as we start to look at cloud technology and you know, this distributed production in general, you know, living with different time domains is something that we actually are, are looking to do. Now, the ground to cloud, cloud to ground work, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk to John about in a minute, but this is something that you know obviously is becoming mainstream. We've been doing play out in the cloud for quite a while. Now play out obviously doesn't have quite the same timing strict requirements that we have in a live production workflow. Um, but we've started to look within VSF as John gave you a summary of yesterday afternoon at some of those technologies. But one of the things we were proud to be part of um, going back almost a year ago now, you heard Evan and um, Thomas talking about CDI earlier before it was even called CDI last May, last May it was still working, the working title of Krill. I think they use fish for everything over there. Um, we actually did the first test here. Now this obviously was a non-optimized latency environment, but this was the first time that we actually tried going to and from a cloud with JPEG XS compression. Um, just to look at the time domains how that how, how low latency we could get it and there was quite a lot of unnecessary timing delay within this original prototype that we did here but that didn't matter for the purposes of what we were trying to do because this was vastly better than I think probably typically the eight seconds or so that had been previously realized in going to and from cloud infrastructure with longer print compression but coming back to the the question of what time really matters um, is it just the relative time of the elements of the production that we're putting together? Do we have a, a specific production time that we need to work through in the whole workflow? Or, and or are we even really bothered about the real wall clock time, the absolute time of day? Which of those times really matters? Thinking about time, and I think we've, um, we've actually, we're almost getting through this now, but the there was a very good talk by Evan and Thomas that kind of covered this. I, I think I can jump forward because as we move into compute, suddenly classic UDP 2110 essences per se don't don't really cut it. And we've you know we've we've very much at the moment the way we've been doing going in and out of virtual functions in a, in a broadcast world. Think of these chunky red lines as all being ST 2110. Um, so. Every time we've gone in and out of a virtual processing function, a compute based function, we've gone back to this nice linear ST2110 stream into you know, a classic switch fabric. And then we've gone into maybe another function or maybe all of those functions aren't virtual, some of them are linear, but we're moving forward now. And actually, if we are actually concatenating using CDI or a future evolution of CDI in a, in a, in a, in a virtual world, then the things we need to do is, is actually be aware of how long each of our processing functions takes and we need to orchestrate the solution so it actually takes the time, um, so we actually can allow for the time taken um, for the propagation and also each of these individual compute functions. And as I alluded to just now, the world's not gonna be all virtual for a long time. So we're always gonna be coming in and out of kind of virtual infrastructure into physical appliances to do specific things. Now, 
when we started to think about how we're defining things that need to actually work in the cloud, I think people originally started asking questions about how are we going to get PTP into a cloud environment so every element of our cloud processing can be intrinsically locked to PTP. And actually, the answer is it doesn't need to be. Um, we, we actually don't need to be that precise in time. We actually have NTP within cloud infrastructure available or an equivalent thereof. So, John, anything to sum up? <laughs> uh, it's just as hard in the cloud as it is in the ground. Um, really, it's about how do we get away from this lockstep, you know, everything happens on a frame boundary model that we've carried on the ground for years and move instead to a data-driven, um, as Andy so eloquently put it, time orchestrated model where you follow the data and things are more or less input staged and input staggered. I think that's the, uh, the, the trick we're moving toward. And so in these uh, groups that are studying this, that's been our, our focus is how do we, you know, what time stamp do you apply? What tag do you apply so that as you take content and divert it into the cloud, it can go through its processing steps and then eventually fold back together. Oh, there's, I know there's been an awful lot of discussion about where timing happens and where resyncs happen in these sorts of hybrid facilities. And it, indeed, Andy, as you were saying, kind of as you um, went away there, whether it needs to happen at all. So we're pretty much out of time. Andy, do you have some more <clears throat> that you would just want to hit the, the high points of? Well, no, all I was going to say is John showed this, John showed this diagram yesterday. All oh, right. Yep. Um, so, so this is, this is where we got to. If you're interested in time and want to join us on the GCCG group, then we're having some great debates and I think we've got some more maturing to do of this. So the only thing it really allows for me to say is um, do join me for a cup of tea. <laughs> if you get a chance. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry about the tech oh, problem. Oh there. no, <laughs> just kidding. Hopefully one day. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs>